So good evening, I'm Mike Wahlbacher, the Executive Director of the Schuylkill Center for Environmental Education. So glad you're here tonight. We're kicking off a new season of Thursday Night Live. We're doing five consecutive weeks of Thursday Night Lives. And we're beginning with the secret life of a goldenrod field timed, um, actually just a little past the peak of goldenrod blooming, but we're gonna share with you the goldenrod story tonight. Um, this photograph, by the way, is from our good friend, Doug Wexler, who's actually here tonight. I just wanna thank Doug for this photograph of goldenrod taken um, at Morris Arboretum in Chestnut Hill. So, um, we took a, a bit of a hiatus um, from, here we are, from Zooming with you all. It's great to be back. It's good to see you all. I'm sorry that we're still in pandemic mode. We actually have begun some uh, in-person programming, which is great, but a lot of you have been on lots of Zooms and other things like this. Here are some things uh, that help you. Make sure to keep the microphone on mute. Uh, keep your video turned off if you don't want to be visible. There is closed captioning available as well. Uh, we are, I will be screen sharing. So uh, in the view options, you might want the side-by-side -side mode from the drop-down menu. Um, and feel free to put your questions in chat and I will do the best that I can uh, to answer them, especially when we get to, to the end. So with that said, there we go. So we are open, the trails are open, the building is open, our art gallery is open, the visitor center is open. So do come for a walk. These are stressful times. And uh, you know, time immersed in nature is really helpful and good. It's restorative. So, so do come for a walk. Do come for some of our programs. As many of you know, uh, we are an environmental education center. We've been doing environmental education since the mid 1960s. One of the pioneers of that in Philadelphia. So, uh, Amanda Cohen, who you can see here, our co-host tonight, is our manager of public programs. So she's uh, she runs a slew of programs for all of you. Uh, at the Nature Center, including on Saturdays. Uh, families can come for Schuylkill Saturdays and get a box uh, of goodies to go for a walk on the field and, and our fields and, and, and forests and do things. So do check out our programming. Um, in addition to that, we operate a preschool, nature preschool. There we are. Uh, the first nature-based, whoa, the first nature-based preschool in the state of Pennsylvania. Uh, there's a network of these opening. Uh, or have opened across the country. Uh, this is in its ninth year already at the Nature Center. And we've been lucky in that the outdoors has been our secret weapon. In COVID, the kids are masked, the teachers are masked, and we're outside 95% of the time. Um, and, and it's just really worked out well for us. So we're proud to have a nature preschool. We also have a really ambitious environmental art program. This is a, a recent installation you can see on our driveway as you come in from an exhibit called uh, All Fall Down uh, on the, effect, the impact of the emerald ash borer on ash trees. Remember, ashes, ashes, we all fall down. So that was the play on that for the, the title of the exhibition. Uh, and this one sculptor essentially rearranged, kind of pixelated the top of a dead ash tree. Uh, and there's signage to interpret next to that what the artist was intending to do. So we have inside and outside installations in our environmental art program. The current show is Al Mudif, a confluence. Al Mudif is the Arabic name for a guest house that Sumerian Arabs have been building for 5,000 years, uh, now Iraqis. Um, and a wonderful Iraqi designer uh, moved to Philadelphia, always wanted to build a Mudif, and he has done lots of research and determined this is the first Mudif built outside of Iraq in 5,000 years. There's never been one outside of Iraq. So we thought if there's gonna be one outside of Iraq, it has to be in Roxburgh. So do come see uh, the Mudif. Uh, and, and actually uh, Yarub, the designer does a monthly, the artist is in where he serves Iraqi tea. So check out the calendar uh, at the end of, towards the end of this month. Uh, there's another one of these events as well. Sarah Cabbage, an environmental artist, has also worked with Yarub and she has done benches out of Phragmites green grass. Actually, these benches are across the whole watershed. There are 23 centers that operate uh, the Alliance of Watershed Education, centers up and down the Delaware and Schuylkill rivers, uh, even up into the Lehigh Valley, down into Delaware, over into New Jersey. Um, and so all of us, uh, not all 23, but most of them have worked with Sarah and we've harvested Phragmites from a number of places. The ones that we use come from the Upper Roxborough Reservoir Preserve across the street from us in the old reservoir. 
um, and also from John Hines, National Wildlife Refuge at Tinicum. So those are the two sources. Um, and Yaru built the Mudif uh, with the assistance of lots of volunteers and Sarah built one of these benches. These are called water spirits. And actually, if you go for a walk in Tinicum, you will stumble upon these. When you go for walks along many of these places, you will actually come upon Sarah's work, which is really exciting. All right. And there's an indoor uh, gallery show to go along with it. So we have an indoor and outdoor exhibition about the Mudif and its construction. Love for you to come see it. It's actually open only this month. The Mudif will actually say open for a couple of months longer. And then we're going to take down at least the roof to winterize it. And then in the spring, see what kind of shape it is uh, to go back. So, so check out the Mudif in the next month. We also operate, as many of you know, the only wildlife clinic in the city of Philadelphia. Thousands of injured orphans, sick animals like this red-tailed hawk that Chris Strub, the director of the clinic, is intubating, getting some moisture into him. So when they have baby squirrels and baby squirrels and baby squirrels and baby squirrels, uh, the most common animal that comes to the wildlife clinic. We are a volunteer organization. Uh, in good days, our volunteer program has been rebooting. Uh, we lost it completely during the pandemic, and we've been slowly uh, getting back on our website, you can check out opportunities to volunteer. We're also a membership based organization. Love our members. Thank you so much. Members get advanced notice of our programs, discounts in our gift shop, including the best bird seed uh, in the region. Um, so do come a member, become a member. And if you are, thank you. We really appreciate it so very much. Uh, so as I said, this is the kickoff of a five week series of uh, Thursday Night Lives. Um, it's great to be back with you all. Next week, we have three gentlemen talking about the city's trash crisis. We're calling it Bill Philadelphia. Um, and one of them is your fave trash man, who's a, a former trash collector who's become a social media star and celebrity. Um, so your fave trash man will be among, and he, he's been using his social media stats to call attention to the city's plight. Um, so we've got three people talking about trash next week. If you have lots of trash questions or concerns or issues or problems, come next week uh, and we're gonna dive, we're gonna do a dumpster dive into trash. Um, in a couple of weeks, um, the fifth in our series, uh, actually, I'm sorry, the fourth in our series is A World on the Wing, the Global Odyssey of Migratory Birds. The reason I'm bringing this up now is because it's uh, being given by a wonderful author and uh, photographer himself, Scott Widensall. Scott's books are great. They're wonderful books. He's an extraordinary naturalist, does research on snowy owls and bird migration and a number of things. I've just read the first couple of pages and he almost dies in the second page from a grizzly bear uh, on a trip to Alaska. So I'm so glad that that didn't happen to him. Uh, but um, we sell the book in the gift shop. Uh, this lecture works whether you, uh, you, you read the book or not, but we'd love you to get Scott's book, uh, read about bird migration. We learned so much in, in recent years. Um, and he's going to be with us um, at the end of the month. So I'd love you to have it. If you can't read the book, come anyway, but we'd love you to get the book in our gift shop. And then um, in a month, we'll be celebrating in person the 16th annual Henry Meggs Environmental Leadership Award, named for uh, a gentleman who was on our board for more than 30 years, uh, Henry Meggs, longest serving trustee in our history, a founder, longest serving trustee. Uh, and the award is going to Mindy Maslin, who's the founder of the Tree Tenders Program. And in almost 30 years, she's planted an orchid plant more than 20,000 trees across the city and the region. And she's trained 5,500 tree tenders to help her do that. So just an extraordinary person who's done really important work in tree planting, which of course is great for the insects we're going to see in just a few minutes and great, of course, for climate change as well. Those trees are going to help cool, cool the planet. So help us celebrate, Mindy. Right now, it's going to be in person uh, in our auditorium. We're watching, of course, COVID, and we'll stay tuned for, for where that where things head. So that's our, our next few Thursdays. But you're here to learn the secret life of a goldenrod field, uh, one of my favorite plants of all time. Um, for me, the natural year is bookended almost by two plants. One at the front end is skunk cabbage. For me, the first wildflower of spring. Uh, a wildflower, yeah, that's the flower, that little sputnik thing in there is the head filled with little flowers. So this is not the flower, uh, but the flower is tucked in there. And it's, it, it has the ability to create heat. It grows in wet places. It begins growing in late February, early March, and it can burn its way through ice. 
So here is a plant with the capacity to melt ice that has that little flower. And it's that, that deep purple color is actually a giveaway once you know plants. This is a giveaway that this thing stinks, skunk cabbage, and smells like rotting flesh. So if you're an insect who is a scavenger on uh, a beetle or a fly, who's looking for dead meat to scavenge, um, a carrion beetle, you're gonna come over to this skunk cabbage and you're gonna crawl inside where the smell is and you're going to walk around uh, inside there and accidentally pollinate the flower. So it's just a great story. It's the first flower of spring. Uh, always happy to see it because it reminds me that this whole parade of wildflowers is about to occur. So at one end of the parade is skunk cabbage and at the other end of the parade are, are goldenrod and their, their kin. So there's a, a cluster of plants, we'll meet some of them, who are blossoming at the end, the tail end of the season. So the wildflower season goes from skunk cabbage in February, March to goldenrod, which is hanging on now in October. And some of these flowers will be, you know, with us maybe until uh, Halloween-ish. Um, but I think uh, goldenrod looks like it's almost finished right now. So, but, but it's a, that's the growing season for wildflowers and goldenrod is at the rear end. So if wildflowers were a clown parade, <laughs> in the clown parade, the white-faced clowns always take the lead. They're the ones who come first. And there's a couple of white-faced clowns. Um, and at the trail end, at the very end of a circus parade or a clown parade are the tramp clowns like Emmett Kelly. Some of you may remember Emmett, maybe the most famous tramp clown of all time. And their job in clown parades or circus parades was to bring up the rear because they had the brooms because they were scooping up the elephant stuff. Uh, they were sweeping the elephant stuff aside. So um, in the hierarchy of clowns, white face uh, at the top, tramps in the rear. So Golden Ron, bless their heart, is the tramp clown of the wildflower world. They bring up the rear of the wildflower parade. And there's a metaphor you didn't expect you were gonna to hear tonight. <laughs> also, had to include this slide for you because Golden Ron may be guilty of a few things, but giving you hay fever is not one. And you'll often see Golden Ron linked to pollen and to hay fever. Um, I remember um, for many years, there were commercials of people standing in a field of goldenrod waving a white flag that they were ready to give up um, and, you know, take this medicine and you'll be okay. Um, as it turns out, goldenrod is not wind pollinated. It just happens to bloom at the exact same time as ragweed. And ragweed is the culprit. Uh, ragweed actually, when you find the flower, it makes sense. If you're a wind pollinated plant, you're not gonna invest a lot of time and energy in growing uh, gorgeous showy flowers. Why would you do that if the wind's pollinating you? You're only gonna grow gorgeous bright yellow big flowers if you're trying to attract insects to you. And that means your pollen is sticky and heavier and it's not gonna blow around in the wind the way that ragweed does. So because they often, they blew at the same time, often in the same place, um, ragweed gets, uh, is the problem. Goldenrod has often gotten the rap. So there's the first thing you need to know is that it's not goldenrod. Uh, those, those commercials are sort of ingrained in American heads because of, the, because of television, but it's not what it is. So instead, because those pollen grains are so heavy, look at this honeybee who's got just extraordinary pollen baskets filled um, with, with goldenrod pollen. And this is really important because now we're again, we're at the tail end, right? This is the tram clown bringing up the rear of the wildflower parade. If you're a honeybee, you need to get as much nectar and pollen into the hive as you can because they're not making it for us. They're making it for themselves to get through the winter that's coming. So goldenrod and their kin become the last chance for these insects to get the pollen and the nectar that they need. Actually, a good goldenrod crop, when they bring it back, uh, will stimulate the queen to plant more, to, to lay more brood. So she's like, okay, we got a good source. Okay, we'll lay some more eggs. She, so they, they actually have lots of cues. So it turns out, oddly enough, goldenrod honey doesn't taste good to us. It's kind of bitter, but goldenrod honey is critically important for them. Many other insects use it too. There's a bumblebee uh, on goldenrod. Um, one of the things I love about the fall 
is that I'll come to, um, this happened this week uh, uh, at the corner of our property on Hagee's Mill Road, which is a great goldenrod field. I'll show you that in a second. And if you get there in the morning, what you might see is a bumblebee, like just hanging on to the plant first thing in the morning and not moving. It's like they're exhausted. They can't go anywhere. They have no energy left. They almost, they die, literally just hanging on to the goldenrod, uh, but they're out there collecting right to the bitter end. So I've seen that many times with um, a bumblebee just sort of exhausted and didn't make it back um, at night. But bees, bumblebees, honeybees, uh, are all it's critically important food for them. And so it's not wind pollinated. You'll often find, or it's not unusual to find, goldenrod blooming in a field with asters. And there are many, many kinds of asters, so many that it's gonna be confusing and hard to know all of them, especially if it's a white aster, there are many species of that. But there's a wonderful, uh, easy to name aster, New England aster that has purple, sometimes blue uh, petals, and then the yellow centers. Um, and you'll often find these two together, which is just such a wonderful thing to see. The on the color wheel of art class you learned back in fifth grade, purple and, and yellow are complementary. So it's almost as if nature knows, I'm gonna give two gorgeous complementary colors side by side uh, to bloom together. So this is not unusual. So for me, when you come across, across goldenrod and asters, a field of goldenrod and asters, you're at the last chance cafe. This is a last chance for all these organisms that we'll meet in a second to get the pollen and the nectar they need for now, um, for the hive, um, and just to stay alive for a little while longer until winter comes. So it's the last chance for all of these critters. Many of you may have read Robin Wall Kimmerer's Braiding Sweetgrass, or maybe have heard of it. She's an indigenous scientist who's trying to sort of uh, make sense of and bridge those two worlds, um, sort of the, the hardcore science with indigenous thought. It's really an extraordinary book. Uh, one of the best environmental books that come out in a very, very long time. So if you haven't read it, highly recommend it. There's a wonderful scene in which she, um, she, she, goes into a professor's office and she gets actually a new red plaid shirt to do this. She's so excited she got a new shirt for this interview and she wants to be a botany major. Of course, this is a long time ago. So she's a woman, uh, an indigenous woman who wants to be a botany major. And she's facing, as you can expect, um, a white male scientist, an older white male scientist. And he says to her, so why do you wanna be? Um, a botany major and she sort of pulls herself up and gives her very her well thought out well reasoned rehearsed answer which is she really wants to understand why goldenrod and new england aster are so beautiful together and the scientist says no that's like art class that's not a botany major <laughs> And it turns out that someone's done research on this and because they're complementary colors, each one is more successful than the other. If it, so if goldenrod alone does well, New England Aster by itself does well, the two together do really well, do better. So somehow that color scheme even works with pollinating insects and they do better. But Robin Wall Kimmerer tells a wonderful story uh, in braiding sweet grass that I highly recommend. Um, there we go. Um, at the Schuylkill Center, there's a couple of places to see Goldenrod. Um, and this is the corner of Hagee's Mill and Port Royal Avenue. And you can see there's one of those big um, towers, right? This is the one by the baseball fields. So this is one of our best Goldenrod fields. So actually you can park by the ball fields and just walk in and see it. Uh, it's on its last legs now. So I highly recommend that I mentioned that uh, Doug had taken the photograph at Morris Arbor Freedom, great place to see Goldenrod. There are a number of other places too. This is actually in our courtyard, uh, right behind the, the Nature Center building, where we've got Goldenrod mixed in with two different kinds of asters, New England and one of the, one of the many white asters, other flowers in there too. Uh, Longwood Gardens has a restored meadow uh, with just lots of goldenrod. So lots of places, and actually even just today driving home along Umbria at the back, the, sort of the bottom of Roxborough, uh, there's just goldenrod in here and there in clumps. It doesn't mind waste places and often you find it in waste places. So not a weed uh, for me, a necessary plant, one of the most important plants uh, of the year. And there's a number of things that you would see 
uh, likely to see in a goldenrod field. And I just wanna show just a couple of them. And it turns out they're all cousins. And there's a reason why this clan of cousins all blooms together at the back end of the wildflower parade. You guys know this, right? Here's black-eyed Susan, right? Um, and black-eyed Susan, it turns out, is a relative of goldenrod, which is a relative of aster. And I just wanna point out one thing before I move on, but you can see when you look in, at the flower, there's a more intense yellow in the center of the petal than there is on the outside. And then you got the dark middle. So if you're a honeybee or a bumblebee, you don't see it that way. They see ultraviolet light. They see the light color on the outside. They see deep purple, that, that yellow in the center uh, reflects back as a deep purple and the black, they see a bullseye. The plant is saying, land here, right? Yellow, purple, black, land right here. So they're giving it a landing pad. Uh, plants are extraordinary giving cues to insects. Plants and insects co-evolved over you know, millions of years and they've worked out a language with each other. You know, we've, it takes us a long time to crack the language, but it's, it's really wonderful. Um, back, um, black eye Susan, this one, has a cousin, brown-eyed Susan. You can see the petals are a little bit shorter. So brown-eyed Susan, we actually have this growing at our front door. As you walk into the front door, look for the brown-eyed Susan. There's our New England aster and there's our golden rod. Uh, white snake root is abundant across the region and is also a member, this white stuff. And actually it's this white snake root, white snake root. Um, that if cattle eat it, so if you have cattle, be mindful of keeping them away from your white snake root. <laughs> um, this is where they get milk disease, believe it or not. Abraham Lincoln's mother famously was one of the most famous people who died uh, of milk disease from the cows, the cows eating um, snake root and the, the people eating, uh, drinking the milk then. Here's an old spent milkweed behind, behind all this, but snake root, very common. Actually, this is the most common weed in my garden. So it's amazing where you can find a uh, white snake root growing. It goes everywhere. Um, daisies are in this clan. Dandelion are in this clan. This is one called thoroughwort. It's got a, you know, one of those long scientific names, eupatorium. There are so many eupatoriums, thoroughworts, bone sets. Those are other names you may have heard. These are in this clan. Joe Pieweed, Joe Pie was an Indian healer. Uh, Joe Pieweed uh, is in this clan. Sunflower is a big member of this clan, all the sunflowers. So um, these are all members of what are called, you can see at the bottom of the slide, composite flowers, the composites, because they're they are, they are comprised of two different kinds of flowers, these kind here and these kind here. So the composites are blooming at the end of the year. So composite flowers and aster, A-C-E, is this family uh, named for asters. Aster means star in Latin, right? So they're star-shaped. Not all are star-shaped, many of them are. But what you've got is two different kinds of flower, a disc flower in the center and a ray flower along the outside. So if you go back to our sunflower, these are actually all flowers in here. These are disc flowers. And these, pretending that they're petals, are ray flowers. So if you actually, if you pull, take, get a dandelion flower and pull one of the yellow petals off, you will actually see a little fuzz connected to it. That's a complete flower. So what happens is it's now fall. It's getting colder. Insects are cold blooded. They don't respond well to cold. They love heat. Butterflies love a 90 degree day in the sun. That's their favorite weather. Um, it, uh, insects don't, you know, they, when it gets colder, they, they have a hard time getting energy, they have a hard time flying, that bumblebee has a hard time making it. So what happened in evolution is the original, you know, flower here, flower here, flower here. What happened is the, the plant evolved to bunch the flowers in big groups. So what you're looking at here is a bouquet of several hundred flowers. So that when the bumblebee lands here, it then walks to here, 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 walks to here. It's giving the bumblebee a target rich environment in which to get pollen and nectar at the time of the year when they don't have a lot of energy to fly. 
It's an extraordinary move on the plant's part. Um, so all these composites are there to be energetically more efficient for, for pollen um, and for nectar for all the insects who depend on them. Uh, and actually you can even see this here. You see those veins, what appear to be the, the petal. Um, you can see this really well in dandelion uh, and you can see this in many of the other composites. When you pull one petal off, the petal is jagged. It has the veins and then it's jagged at the end. What you're seeing is the ancestral petals that fuse together to form the one, what, the one ray flower. So you, you'll see the, the little remnants, the teeth at the end that are the remnants of that fusion uh, millions of years ago. So we got a whole lot of composites blossoming right now, ray flowers and disc flowers. There we are. And you can see there's the veins. Okay, back to goldenrod for a moment. So goldenrod is blooming among the, the many of the composites. Um, but for me, it's one of the prominent of the composites. The genus name is Solidago, uh, which is based on medieval Latin. Uh, it means uh, to be whole, to, to make whole. Oh, here we are, I'm sorry. To make whole, there we go. Um, so Solidago is an old Latin to make whole because it was used uh, medicinally. The teas were made from it with lots of vitamins and it made you whole. So Solidago, actually that's our genus. Uh, when we refer to it in the scientific name, but if you go to Europe, in several countries in Europe, like Italy, Portugal, Solidago is the name. There is no common name outside of Solidago. That's what they call it. So it's so it's a it's a big clan that goes both ways. All right. So Solidago is ours, and if you go to that same corner um, at Port Royal and Hagee's Mill, uh, where you'll see this, you'll see a very common for me the most common. Uh, and maybe one of the most easy to identify of all the golden rods, there are many. I'm only gonna give you a few because for me, it's not important that you know each one by name. It's important that you see some of the diversity of golden rod, but it's a, it might be fun for you to be able to name a few. And I'm gonna give you two big ones that you can name. Canada golden rod, Solidago canadensis. Canadensis is a, a specific name that you'll see, a species name that you'll see with many, many, many animals and plants. Um, so it was, essentially discovered first in Canada. Uh, so it's not uncommon to name things canadensis. And many of the things who are named canadensis, uh, Canada geese, um, live far outside um, of, of Canada. But here's Canada goldenrod. And one of the easy ways you can tell that is A, it's tall, really tall, like six foot. It's got those big plumes of flowers. But what it'll have is it'll have one midrib, one strong midrib down the leaf, and then two, parallel on the side. So essentially three veins, one, two, three. So tall goldenrod, among the tallest, with long narrow leaves with three veins, and then you've got Solidago canadensis, Canada goldenrod. One of the easier ones to see, one of the more common ones, but we have at least three goldenrods in the fields. We have more elsewhere at the Schuylkill Center. Uh, oh, here's another view, I'm sorry, of the one, two, three, one, two, three. You can see the sunlight behind it, one, two, three. So Canada goldenrod, um, many places at the Schuylkill Center, one of the more common ones. Here's the other one. Looks so much like uh, Canada goldenrod, but rough goldenrod, also sometimes called wrinkle-leaved goldenrod. And that's a cue maybe to what a clue might, might be wrinkled or rough, rugosa, uh, which is a botanical word for rough. Its leaves are different. Look, you can't see the three prominent veins. You've got like a network. So this one looks more wrinkly and crinkly um, when you look at it. And if you put the uh, uh, canadensis canada alongside it, don't mind the color. The color here is just an artifact of the, the photograph. So don't worry about the color. So it's not like this one is always bright green and this one is always sort of more blue green, but look at the leafing. Um, so actually at that corner that I mentioned and in our meadow, you can actually find often Canada and rough leaves growing side by side. So you can also see, and it's fun to see if you can tease out the two. We have a third goldenrod, um, which is the, the grass leaved. Look at the narrow leaves of this one that looks like uh, thin like grasses. So they were inspired by that. It also looks, it's kind of flat topped which Canada goldenrod is not. Canada goldenrod has those plumes. This is flat topped. For most of my life, this was also a solid dango. It was recently 
Um, scientists come in as lumpers and splitters, lots of splitting going on in the botanical world. And so what was solidago gramnifolia, gram, grass, folia, leaf, grass leaved, solidago is now euthamia gramnifolia. So they're using genetics now to tease out plants and animals and often finding that things that we're using visual cues for don't work genetically. And so they've, they've carved this out into its own genus. It's still called grass leaf um, Goldermann and it is still a composite, but it's not in the solid dango genus. However, there is even um, in the forest and along the forest edges, other golden rods, reef golden rods, which actually you can, it, it, it grows, right? The Canada golden rod is tall and the, it's a plume at the end of flowers. Reef golden rod is shorter, more demure, not as tall, uh, one stem and the flowers um, growing in the axles of the leaves down the stem. So you can take it off and make a wreath of goldenrod flowers, um, hence the name. And then one of my favorites, zigzag goldenrod. Looks a little bit like wreath goldenrod, but this one in the stem, when you watch the stem, it zigs to a flower, then zags to a flower, and then zigs to a flower, and then zags to a flower. So it goes, it's, it's not that, prominent here, but you can see a little bit of a zig and a little bit of a zag and a little bit, there you go. Um, and here there's goes to one and then on this one's under the leaf. But look for a zigzag goldenrod zigging and zagging in forest. So there's actually goldenrod that grows in forest. So it's not just uh, uh, a meadow plant. There's even a beach version of it, which you may have seen at the Jersey Shore, seaside goldenrod, solidago, great specific name, sempervirens. Anybody want to put in chat? Can you translate that? Ah, I'm just now seeing questions. I'm so sorry. Yeah, there is golden rod in the pine barrens. Actually, this one uh, there are and others. But yes, um, and I'll talk about insects in one second, Sandy. Sorry about that. Uh, Semper virens, always green, right? Semper always virens, green, always green. Not quite always green, but it's green for much of the year. Uh, so seaside goldenrod, you'll see at the Jersey Shore. Um, and I mentioned before uh, um, that this is not wind pollinated and showed you the honeybee and the bumblebee. And now I wanna share with you all the many insects that are dependent on goldenrod uh, at this time and their kin at this time of year. There are a large number of wasps who surprisingly you will find uh, coming onto goldenrod. Um, the one on the left is a parasitic wasp, so it's going to lay its egg um, inside other things. That's actually a long ovipositor of the female right here. So um, many different wasps will come to goldenrod, um, and even uh, a locust boring beetle. Uh, and here's a good old yellow jacket. So you'll find yellow jackets, and a lot of them are actually eating the pollen. Pollen is good protein. So these insects are coming, and they're not going to pass up a good protein meal. Um, so bumblebees, honeybees are getting the nectar. I'll show you some else who's getting nectar, but these guys are more after the pollen. You might see something that looks like a um, yellow jacket, but look at the size of those eyes, really big compound eyes, only two wings, only two wings. And if you looked at this, um, not quite yellow jacket, jacket enough in the shape of his body, but this is actually a fly. This is one of the true flies. True flies, house flies are true flies. Mosquitoes are true flies. There are a number of them, crane flies. Um, true flies have two, wing, two wings, not four. Uh, so they've downsized the number of wings. Um, and there's a big grouping of hover flies, they're called, who mimic yellow jackets um, and other wasps to get their protection. So they tell birds, don't mess with me, I'm a wasp when really it's just a fly that can't hurt you. So a number of insects do that, but it's gonna be hanging out uh, and sipping nectar and grabbing pollen. Um, and there's our locust borer, that beetle I mentioned before. But lots of beetles, actually a large number of beetles who will be on goldenrod. Wasps, flies, beetles, and butterflies, like this painted lady who's cohabiting with a, uh, uh, another wasp up here and a bumblebee down here. So here's a painted lady butterfly, one of the blues, uh, Blues are a big grouping of butterflies. Um, they'll be on it. A buckeye, named for uh, these, these shapes along the wing, uh, sitting on goldenrod. And a gray hair streak, also on goldenrod. So this is, and this one actually, uh, this butterfly is much bigger than the gray hair streak. So this is a smallish one. 
Um, I'll just point out one thing on the gray hair sheet before I move on, but you see kind of this red um, splotch with a little dark here. So it looks a little bit like an eye-ish if you squint. And then it's got these tails coming off. And what the gray, what the hair streaks will do is they all have that hair streak, it's called at the, at the bottom, and they move it like this. And they have these spots by the back end. And so what they're doing is, is telling the bird, this is really my front end over here. This is my head. This is my head. So the bird nips at where it thinks the head is and gets a little bit of wing and the hair streak flies off and the body is fine. It didn't get the head. It only got a nip of, you know, like a, you see a triangle cut out of on the wing of the hair streak sometimes where it got nipped. I've seen that on, on many butterflies um, and it gets away. So it's a great trick that it has. So there's a hair streak. So there's a number of butterflies that come to Golden Run. And of course, if you are a monarch butterfly flying on this extraordinary migration from Pennsylvania to Mexico, um, goldenrod is critical because it's, you know, it's like this big golden uh, magnet pulling you down or a golden lantern shining up, right? So there's a goldenrod field. And if you're a butterfly uh, monarch and you got to get south, you got to get there by a certain window of time. Um, this is just so important to find. So they, they alight on the goldenrod um, and they're going for the nectar. Butterflies are nectar sippers. Uh, they accidentally pollinate, but they're only sipping nectar. So they're, they're, they, they drink the world through their straw-like mouth. Um, here's a wonderful photograph of a large group of monarch butterflies on their migration south. Uh, by the way, um, also in this series, Chip Taylor, who is the founder of Monarch Watch, uh, which, and, and one of the most important scientists working on monarchs, uh, works at the University of Kansas. He'll be Zooming with us in a couple of weeks and he's gonna give us an update on the monarch story this year. So we're gonna get live information on how monarchs are doing right now. So monarch is a big story. This migration is an extraordinary thing. It is of course, as you probably know, troubled. Um, so Chip Taylor of Monarch Watch from Kansas is gonna be with us. I'm really excited about that. And here's seaside goldenrod uh, with it. So um, many monarchs will actually fly along the Jersey shore. Um, Cape May is just a great place. Cape May Point is a great place to see monarchs. So lots of birders go there in the fall this time of year. And they sit uh, on the deck at Cape May Point and their Audubon of course is counting uh, the birds that fly over. Uh, just think, it's just a, an amazing phenomenon. Uh, I, got there one day a couple of years ago, just happened to be there on the right day and they were pouring over, uh, just, just remarkable numbers of birds of prey coming over. It's just really an extraordinary thing. Um, but the monarchs come too. So they, they come down Jersey's funnel and get to Cape May Point and they wait for the weather to be right to make the leap across the point. So the monarchs are doing that along with the birds. So Seaside Golden Run, it turns out is important for monarchs in this trip as well. And if all these insects are coming to goldenrod and goldenrod fields, you can guess that lots of predators are gonna be coming there too, right? Uh, nature abhors a vacuum, goldenrod is there. It's attracting all these insects. Animals have to evolve to handle this food. So here's a goldenrod crab spider. Hard to suss out the crab spider from the goldenrod, isn't it? <laughs> Look at the color of that thing. There's, uh, there he is. Um, so uh, cephalothorax, abdomen, there's one leg, here's another leg, but it's got, it's got this poor fly. There's one of those flies that wants to be a bee. Um, so it's got that one. Um, goldenrod crab spider, there are other crab spiders and other spiders who are in goldenrod as well. I've often seen uh, dragonflies cruising above goldenrod fields. Um, with swallows too, because if you're a golden, if you're a, if you if insects are flying into the golden rod, a dragonfly is going to cruise above it to get the insects. So um, there we go. the blue darner. Um, and here, I don't know if you can see this or not, but where my cursor is is a praying mantis. Uh, I I here's a triangle head. Uh, here's the body. It is a her. That brown abdomen is kind of peeking out. Uh, she's lo loaded with eggs. So she's getting ready to lay. And of course, look how she, that green blends in. Uh, and here's one of her legs going down here. So she's, she's ready to get one of those bees, flies, wasps, butterflies that lands. So you've got spiders, uh, dragonflies, 
praying mantises, lots of things, eating them. But then um, you've also got this in a goldenrod field. And this is just a great little story. It's like this weird swelling on the stem of the goldenrod. Um, and a ball um, that's just there in the middle. So it's almost as if the goldenrod got sick or something, or there's like an abnormal growth. What's going on here? Well, it turns out that there is a fly called a peacock fly because it struts like a peacock to attract a mate. Uh, the peacock fly, also called the goldenrod gall fly, uh, when they mate, the female goes off to goldenrod and she lays her egg in the stem of the goldenrod. And the goldenrod with that egg, she also has a chemical which irritates the uh, stem and causes the plant to grow. It changes the pattern of the stem's growth and the plant begins to rearrange its tissue and it makes a ball of tissue with the larva tucked inside. So here is the goldenrod ball gall in the winter. And so during the winter, um, and you actually see a few more in the background, uh, in the winter, there's a larva of a fly sleeping through the winter in there. Uh, very happily. And when uh, it's hungry, it just nibbles on the wall of the gall. So it's essentially mom is giving it a home and food at the same time. Um, the larva, here we are, is just a little grubby thing tucked in here. And it actually digs a tunnel. I think this might, I think this is the tunnel right here. Um, it digs a tunnel, right? Uh, before it's ready to pupate. Um, so it digs a tunnel and leaves just that one little thin flap of skin on the outside, the crust of the ball gall, and then goes back inside. So it's got that escape hatch already dug out. And then it's in there and it gets through the winter. And then it forms a pupa, a pupal case in there. And then it transforms into a fly, that peacock fly, who only lives for a couple of weeks because its job is to mate and, and get new larvae going again. So, um, so now this, this peacock fly adult that doesn't have any chewing mouth parts has to get out of a ball gall. So it crawls up that tunnel and it has a sac on its forehead that it inflates. It inflates that sac and it bursts a hole through that little, uh, that thin layer of skin and out goes the peacock fly. <laughs> so there's the peacock fly who lays its eggs in the stem of goldenrod uh, to make a ball gall to live inside. Ah, but now you've got all these little galls hanging out in goldenrod fields that have things inside them. And there's the guy right there with his tunnel, right? So there's that nice tunnel. So they're all, you know, great little food source if you know how to exploit this. Um, so you might once in a while come across a big hole dug out of a goldenrod ball and gall. So like as if somebody pecked into the ball and gall, right? Um, so for every reaction in nature, there's an equal and opposite reaction. So you get this great gall that it evolves with this great food source. Somebody has to evolve to say, hey, I, I know how to eat that. And so there is a downy woodpecker uh, who sits on goldenrod ball and galls and pecks away. Chickadees can do this too, which is probably not surprising to you. So chickadees and downy woodpeckers are among the birds who can take advantage of goldenrod ball and galls. And that's just the beginning of a whole bunch of galls that are all over them. Here's the ball gall, but look below. This little leaf spot is also a gall. There's another insect living inside that who's so thin, it's living between the tissues um, of the layers of the leaf itself. It's just living in there. Um, and then uh, this is also at the same corner, uh, the goldenrod field at the Schuylkill Center. There's a leaf bunch gall where the, the insect lays its egg here and instead of the leaves growing, the plant growing tall, uh, it doesn't grow any more stem and just the leaves all come up out at this one place and forms this mass of leaves uh, with the gall insect deep inside all of this. So it's just too much work uh, for anybody to get to. So you've got a leaf bunch gall, ball gall, leaf bunch gall, splotch galls, you've got all kinds of galls. Um, so, for me, goldenrod is really a remarkable plant with just this whole story. Um, I look forward to it every year. Uh, hate it when it ends. I know I have to wait 
for um, for the next year when the uh, skunk cabbage reappears, get the wildflowers back. But um, so tonight, if you learned anything, you know that you're not going to blame goldenrod for your allergies. You're going to go right to ragweed and, and let the goldenrod be. Goldenrod is the tramp clown of the wildflower parade, bringing up the rear. It brings up the end of the parade. It's the last chance cafe for hundreds, if not thousands of different species of insects who come to it for its nectar and pollen, and actually to eat the leaves and things as well. Um, necessary food for migrating monarchs uh, flying to Mexico. Um, so it's a necessary stopover for them. Um, and it's got this, you know, all these great little secrets like ball galls that grow in them. So let me see. Oh, what color do you think the monarchs see the golden rod as? That's a great question. And I, I, I honestly, if anybody else knows the answer, I'd love to, you know, type that in. But no, I don't know what, what color they see them as. Um, that's really great. Feel free to type any other questions in here as well. Um, so Sandy, I think I answered your question. They, they're fairly indiscriminate. They attract everybody. Um, any wasps have the insects in the gall? Actually, some, uh, some of the other galls are made by wasps. Um, wasps are famous gall makers, especially on oak trees. You might've seen the oak apple gall, that round swelling on oak trees. Um, but when you cut it open, it's got this weird tissue inside. So that's actually, there's a lot of galls on, um, uh, a lot of galls on oak trees. Um, but I don't know of wasps that go into the gall and get anybody. I don't know about that. I don't think so, but I don't know for sure. Yeah, where did Goldenrod originate? I don't know, great question. Uh, I don't know which, um, if it's in, um, if it's Eurasian and North American, where did it start? Uh, great question, I don't know. Um, you know, I don't think you can, if you eat goldenrod, nothing is going to happen to you. There was a tea that was made for it, hence the name Saladego, that makes you whole. Uh, we've long lost the tradition of making tea from goldenrod. There are so many other plants that I've seen. Um, um, there are so many other plants that we've used medicinally for so many other things. And actually I've lectured about those a lot, uh, but I don't, um, as to the question about, um, the medicinal uses, you know, I, I, I don't know more than what I've said to you tonight, I'm sorry. So um, I was surprised actually um, to learn that, it, that that was where the name came from. I've been talking about, I've been talking about goldenrod in Solidago for literally decades and never thought to look up the etymology of where the name comes from until today. Um, so uh, I apologize for that, but um, no. So I don't know, you know, in which culture, well, Certainly, the culture is European. If that's the name of the plant in many in many European countries, um, so what it does, I don't know. Um, ah, skunk cabbage. We saw last weekend some small shoots. Is that unusual? There are sprouts that will go dormant. I hope they go dormant. Uh, if anybody knows the answer, I that would be great. I know that climate change is kind of rearranging things. Um, so um, you know, some things they, they're getting miscues, and I actually I feel like golden run is. To me, it feels like it's blooming a little early sometimes. I'm getting nervous that it's, um, you know, for me, it's still early-ish October and it seems to be on its way out. Um, in my mind, it would have gone a little bit longer, uh, but I think there's pieces of it that hang on. Yeah, um, you can see seaside goldenrod in the Pine Barrens. There may be another one as well, and I apologize uh, for not knowing that offhand. All right. So when you go to a goldenrod field, go to um, Longwood Meadows, uh, Longwood Gardens, or Morris Arboretum, or come back to the Google Center and go do check that out. So I do check them out and, and make sure you immerse yourself in goldenrod. Next week, we'll be here again for Philadelphia, the city's trash crisis with three, um, three really smart people who are deeply worried about where the city is with trash and recycling. Um, not just in the pandemic, now that we're coming out of it, but post pandemic. So, and we'll give you an update on where things stand. On, on trash collection. Uh, Scott Widensall at the end of the month, so do check out his book. And then of course we have the Megs Award um, in mid-November or just before Thanksgiving. And we hope to see you there in person. So I wanna thank you all for coming, really appreciate it. So glad you're all here. Uh, hopefully I'll see you next week um, at our trash crisis. Thank you all. Feel free to unmute yourselves and say, you know, say goodnight and goodbye to anybody you'd like to. Goodbye.
<laughs> Thanks, Ed. Good night. Good evening. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you, Pat. Thank you. Take care. Yeah. Thanks, Mike. You got it, Doug. Thanks for the photograph. Beautiful. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. And thank you, Amanda, very much for, for helping us on Zoom tonight. Thank you so much.